Chapter 4 I see dead people, but then by God I do something about it. This proactive strategy is rewarding but dangerous. Some days it results in an unusual amount of laundry. After I changed into clean jeans and a fresh white t-shirt, I went around to Mrs. Sanchez's back porch to confirm for her that she was visible, which I did every morning. Through the screen door, I saw her sitting at the kitchen table. I knocked and she said, Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I said. I hear you just fine. Who do you hear? You, Rosalia Sanchez. Come in then, odd Thomas, she said. Her kitchen smelled like chilies and corn flour, fried eggs and jack cheese. I'm a terrific short order cook, but Rosalia Sanchez is a natural born chef. Everything in her kitchen is old and well-worn, but scrupulously clean. Antiques are more valuable when time and wear have laid. Laid a warm patina on them. Mrs. Sanchez's kitchen is as beautiful as the finest antique with the priceless patina of a life's work and of cooking done with pleasure and with love. I sat across the table from her. Her hands were clasped tightly around a coffee mug to keep them from shaking. You are late this morning, Odd Thomas. Invariably, she uses both names. I sometimes suspect she thinks Odd is not a name but a royal title like prince or duke, and that protocol absolutely requires that, is, that it is to be used by commoners when they address me. Perhaps she thinks that I am a son of a deposed king, reduced to tattered circumstances, but nonetheless deserved, deserving of respect. I said, late, yes, I'm sorry. It's been a strange morning. She doesn't know about my special relationship with the deceased. She's, she's got enough problems without having to worry about dead people making pilgrimages to her garage. Can you see what I'm wearing? She asked worriedly. Pale yellow slacks, a dark yellow and brown blouse. She turned sly. Do you like the butterfly barrette in my hair, Odd Thomas? There's no barrette. You're holding your hair back with a yellow ribbon. It looks nice that way. As a young woman, Rosalia Sanchez must have been remarkably beautiful. At 63, having added a few pan pounds, having acquired the seams and crinkles of seasoning experience, she possessed the deeper beauty of the beautified. The sweet humility and the tenderness that time can teach. The appealing glow of care and character that in their last years on this earth no doubt marked the faces of those who were late canonized, later canonized as saints. When you didn't come at the usual time, she said, I thought you'd been here but couldn't see me, and I thought I couldn't see you anymore either. That is when I became invisible to you, and you also became invisible to me. Just late, I assured her. It would be terrible to be invisible. Yeah. But I wouldn't have to shave as often. When discussing invisibility, Mrs. Sanchez refused to be amused. Her saintly face found a frown of disapproval. When I've worried about becoming invisible, 
I've always thought I'd be able to see other people. They just wouldn't be able to see me. Or hear me. In those old Invisible Man movies, I said, you could see his breath when he went out in really cold weather. But if people become invisible to me when I'm invisible to them, she continued, then it's like I'm the last person in the world. All of it, empty except for me, wandering around alone. She shuddered. Clasped in her hands, the coffee mug knocked against the table. When Mrs. Sanchez talks about invisibility, she's talking about death. But I'm not sure she realizes this. If the true first year of the new millennium, 2001, had not been good for the world in general, it would have been bleak for Rosalia Sanchez in particular beginning with the loss of her husband, Herman, on a night in April. She had gone to sleep next to the man whom she had loved for more than forty years, and awakened beside a cold cadaver. For Herman, death had come as gently as it ever does, in sleep. But for Azalia, the shock of waking with the dead had been traumatic. Later that year, still mourning her husband, she had not gone with her three sisters and their families on a long-planned vacation to New England. On the morning of September 11th, 11th, she awakened to the news that their return flight out of Boston had been hijacked and used as a guided missile in one of the most infamous acts in history. Although Rosalia had wanted children, God had given her none. Herman, her sisters, her nieces, her nephews, had been at the center of her life. She lost them all while sleeping. Sometimes, sometime between that September and that Christmas, Rosalia had gone a little crazy with grief, quietly crazy. Because she had never in lived her entire life quietly since. Oh, come on now. Jesus Christ. There we go. Uh, where was I? Quietly crazy. Because she had lived her entire life quietly and knew no other way to be. In her gentle madness, she would not acknowledge that they were dead. They had merely become invisible to her. Nature, in a quirky mood, had resorted to a rare phenomenon that might at any moment be reversed like a magnetic field, making all her lost loved ones visible to her again. The details of all the disappearances of ships and planes in the Bermuda Triangle were known to Rosalia Sanchez. She'd read every book that she could find on the subject. She knew about the inexplicable, apparently overnight vanishment of hundreds of thousands of Mayans from the cities of Copan, Piedras Negras, and Palenque in A.D. 610. 610. Yeah. If you allowed Rosalia to bend your ear... She would nearly break it off in an earnest discussion of historical disappearances. For instance, I know more than I care to know, and immeasurably more than I need to know, about the evaporation to a man of a division of 3,000 Chinese soldiers near Nanking in 1939. Well, I said, at least you're visible this morning. You've got another whole day of visibility to look forward to, and that's a blessing. Rosalia's biggest fear is that on the same day her loved ones are made visible again, she herself will vanish. Though she longs for their return, she dreads the consequences. She crossed herself, looked over the homey kitchen, and at last smiled. I could bake something. You could bake anything, I said. What would you like me to bake for you, Odd Thomas? 
surprise me, I consulted my watch. I better get to work. She accompanied me to the door, gave me a goodbye hug. You are a good boy, Odd Thomas. You remind me of my Granny Sugars, I said. Except you don't play poker, drink whiskey, or drive fast cars. That's sweet, she said. You know, I thought the world in all of Pearl Sugars. She was so feminine, but also... Kick ass, I suggested. Exactly. At the church's strawberry festival one year, there was a rowdy man, mean on drugs or drink. Pearl put him down with just two punches. She had a terrific left hook. Of course, first she kicked him in the special tender place, but I think she could have handled him with the punches alone. I've sometimes wished I could be more like her. From Mrs. Sanchez's house, I walked the six blocks to the Pico Mundo Grill, which is in the heart of downtown Pico Mundo. Every minute that it advanced from sunrise, the morning became hotter. The gods in the Mojave don't know the meaning of the word moderation. Long morning shadows grew shorter before my eyes, retreating from steadily warming lawns, from broiling back blacktop, from concrete sidewalks as suitable for the frying of eggs as the griddle that I would be soon attending. The air lacked the energy to move. Trees hung limp. Birds either retreated to leafy roosts or flew higher than it had at dawn, far up where thinner air held the heat less tenaciously. In this wilted stillness between Mrs. Sanchez's house and the grill, I saw three shadows moving. All were independent of a source, for they were not ordinary shadows. When I was much younger, I called these entities shades, but that is just another word for ghosts, and they are not ghosts like Penny Callisto. I don't believe they ever passed through this world in human form or knew this life as we know it. I suspect that they don't belong here, that a realm of eternal darkness is their intended home. Their shape is liquid. Their substance is no greater than that of a shadow. Their movement is soundless. Their intentions, though mysterious, are not benign. Often they slink off like cats, though cats as big as men. At times they, at times they run semi-erect like dream creatures that are half man, half dog. I do not see them often. When they appear, their presence always signifies oncoming trouble of a greater than usual intensity and a darker than usual dimension. They are not shades to me now. I call them bodocks. Bodoc is a word that I heard a visiting six-year-old English boy use to describe these creatures when I was... When, in my company, he glimpsed a pack of them roaming the Picomundo twilight. A bodoc is a small, vile, and supposedly mythical beast in the British Isles who comes down chimneys to carry off naughty children. I don't believe these spirits that I see are actually bodocs. I don't think the English boy believes so either. The word popped into his mind only because he had no better name for them. Neither do I. He was the only person I have ever known who shared my special sight. Minutes after he spoke the word Bodoc in my presence, he was crushed to death between a runaway truck and a concrete block wall. By the time I reached the grill, three Bodocs had joined in a pack. They ran far ahead of me, shimmered around the corner, and disappeared as though they had been nothing. More than heat imps, mere tricks of the desert air and the grueling sun. Fat chance. Some days I find it difficult to concentrate on being the best short-order cook that I can be. This morning I would need more than the usual discipline to focus my mind on my work 
and to ensure that the omelets, home fries, burgers, and bacon melts that came off my grill were equal to my reputation. Reputation. <laughs>